Win big in 2024 with rotoballer.com's MLB Premium Pass. It includes our preseason draft kit, 15 exclusive lineup tools, and the Team Sync platform. Get customized rankings for your specific league format. Sync your leagues with Team Sync and use our new live draft assistant. Then get customized advice for your scoring settings. Get a discount for any MLB Premium Pass using my promo code Knuckler. Just visit rotoballer.com, sign up today, and start rotoballing like a boss with the fantasy baseball season starting today. Uh, we uh, This podcast is also brought to you by Parlay Play Fantasy Sports. Use my referral code, Roto Brady. Get that sweet, sweet deposit bonus. They got free contests going on tonight. Paid contest coming to a state near you. That's a very fun platform. They're giving out boosts all the time. Highly recommend that you check it out. And what is up, everybody? This is Brady Grove bringing you another interlude episode of Roto Baller's official MMA podcast. Tap that uh, for all picks on that I make on all major MMA events, uh, regional events, major boxing matches. Follow me on Twitter at Roto Brady. Follow the podcast, like, subscribe, and all of that at Tap That MMA Podcast on Facebook, YouTube, and Spotify. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Clive Allison calls a stop to this contest. At one minute, 18 seconds of round number three, declaring your winner by TKO and earning another victory for Team BYB tonight, Shelby Boom Boom Cannon. I like that. <laughs> I like with, that. With me tonight. She is four and six as a, in MMA for her amateur career. 33 years old, fighting out of Anderson, Indiana. She's got a big fight coming up at BYB 25 on April 4th for the super flyweight title against Agnesa Kirikosian, Spitfire. She is 2 and as a professional Barrett Knuckle boxer. Give it up for Shelby. Boom, boom, cannon. Shelby, thank you so much for being here tonight. How's it going? Oh, it's going good. This is awesome. Thank you for having me. It's nice to meet you. No, it's it's great to meet you too. And like the, so th there's a lot of awesome fights going on at BYB 25. Uh, I, I've already talked to Cub Hawkins and Agnesa uh, just this week. And so it, it's a big event. Uh, and so moving forward towards it, like I, I know I just caught you like coming out of like the, the sauna and all that kind of stuff for the day. What's the preparation been like for April 4th? Uh, the preparation's been like a long time coming. We've been preparing for Agnesa for quite a while. I've been following her since her fight in Dubai. And I'm just, I'm ready to get in there. A lot of times people ask me, are you ready? And I'm like, oh, I'm getting there. And this fight, they're like, are you ready? I'm like, oh yeah, I'm ready. I've been ready. So. And so like, just now I want to, I want to go backward because that's usually where I start is like, you know, you started off with a bunch of different like MMA, like you, you had an extensive amateur career. Uh, you fought an HR MMA, which is, I know an organization that's local to the tri-state area of Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana, uh, and B2 fight series, a very, you know, respectable organization, then Island fights for your last amateur fight. How did you get into combat sports at all, you know, as your amateur career began uh, in 2018? Well, I mean, the father of my son's been in combat sports since we were 17 years old. And I'd say he probably got my interest, you know, back then. I was not personally in it and I did not train, but that was where my interest peaked. I didn't start training until after I opened a business with my mom. And I think I just was used to being real busy with two jobs, working as a waitress. Um, you know, I was in school, opening my own business, and it got to the point where I was comfortable. I felt like I wanted to do something. I wanted to be in shape. So I started showing up at the gym and, you know, the people there were like, oh, you know, you should try kickboxing. You'd be great. So I tried kickboxing and I TK owed the girl in the first round. They're like, oh, you'd be great in MMA. And you know, I did that and I'm like, eh, okay. And then bare knuckle shows up and it's like, all right, yeah, I'm in there. So just kind of been a process. And so, like to go a little bit along, like, so you, you started off, uh, and you, you started up losing, uh, four of your first five amateur MMA, but then you rattled off three straight and, and really solid organizations. Was, was there anything that you remember in particular that kind of clicked in between the start of your amateur career and when you started winning, like, you know, a, a lot of fights consecutively? 
Uh, my training changed. I changed coaches and uh, we just started getting a little bit more grittier, more serious. Um, my, you know, my last training at the beginning of my career, it was just kind of sporadic here and there. I didn't, you know, feel like maybe there is as much commitment with my coach. And so when my, my present coach right now, coach McIntyre, he kind of stepped in, um, he just pretty much put me under his wing and took me over and was like, all right, this is what we're doing, whether you like it or not. And I'm like, well, I like it. So let's do it. And we just kind of moved on and it's been me and him ever since. And I mean, he's definitely been the biggest difference in my training and why I'm winning and, you know, why I'm in the best shape of my life. So. And Rob McIntyre actually in the house tonight. Uh, Rob, do, do you concur with Shelby's answer about what, what kind of turned the tide uh, at, at, at that portion of her amateur MMA career? Yeah, she, uh, I mean, I've, I actually, when she's talking about her, her son, Sebastian, his, his father, I was his coach. So that's how I've known Shelby since she was 15 or 16 years old. And I, my son actually talked me into coaching. I quit coaching uh, because I coached for, for too long and got out of it because fighters were being treated like crap. And I, not to slam anybody under the door, but that's how she was being treated. Just like not being taken seriously, even though she killed herself. And then when I walked in, I got asked to start coaching again and kind of helping. And Shelby came in and it was like, okay, this is how you're supposed to do. It. This is how it's supposed to be. And she's like, okay. And she ate it up. Anything I throw at her, she doesn't ask. She doesn't question. She doesn't bitch. She doesn't moan. She just does it. And I've been training fighters from MMA, Muay Thai, kickboxing for 20 plus years. And she will outwork everybody I've ever worked with. And, you know, you said something interesting that I want to get both of your takes on is, you know, Shelby, you fought in five different organizations in your amateur MMA career. And, you know, has anybody that has, you know, talked to anybody or, or been around, you know, the amateur MMA scene in different organizations, there's a very big difference between an organization that has run poorly and an organization that has run well, no matter what the level is. So what were kind of your various experiences like during your amateur MMA career about just the different ways that a uh, professionalism that certain organization or uh, organizations are run with. Um, I think, can you hear me? Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, we were, we were blessed for the most part, as far as being surrounded by professional organizations and uh, people supporting us and um, things being ran smoothly. I mean, we might've had one incident where, you know, maybe we didn't have water in the back, like, you know, we probably needed, <laughs> um, you know, there, there was, uh, most of the time though, you know, people, especially with B2, you know, B2, they were awesome. We also fought for, um, Kokomo, uh, with Mark Slater in Coliseum combat. That was always a great show. He always sold out, um, very organized, always got paid, uh, for ticket sales. Um, B2 was the same way. Uh, I mean, I don't really remember any time where, it was, um, you know, it was like a blow up or where we were like, man, we're never fighting for them again. So. And Rob, I'm sure in coaching, uh, I'm sure that you have seen all sorts of uh, situations with organizations run really well and organizations run terribly. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, though, BYB. Um, I'm not one that keeps my cool when things aren't right. I. I, I just very, very straightforward. This is how it is. This is how it should be like the case, the situation over the water, not being in a locker room, that conversation didn't go over very well because it's, it's about the fighters as long as you do this. But I, I, I tell you what, I cannot say enough about everybody that works for BYB. And it's not just because that's who we're fighting for. I'm dead serious. If I, it doesn't matter who it is. If I have a question or if there's a situation, if I send a text and said, Hey man, you know, let me do this. All right, let me give you a chance, and I'll get a phone call. I don't get a text saying, hey, what's up? I get a phone call. And they're by far top of the line as far as I'm concerned, man. I've, I've dealt with another bare-knuckle organization, and they were nothing but a giant pain in the ass. <laughs> and that, that seems to have been the common sentiment, too, like with everybody from BYB I've talked to this week. And, you know, just the way that they went about setting up this conversation. You know, you don't see a lot a, a lot of people are kind of left to freelance things on like this on their own. And they're not really, you know, yeah. these opportunities aren't necessarily set up for them. Uh, and so with BYB, 
you know, that's why they've been able to attract, you know, so many people from so many different disciplines and why they've been able to, you know, grow and be seen so quickly. One, you know, having a guy like my, I, I've mentioned it, you know, in each conversation that I've had, but like having a veteran commentator who's been around the sport for, you know, over two decades, it gives it, your organization so much legitimacy. And then you see people come in, people are, you know, people are wrestlers, people are former UFC fighters, especially in the BYU oh, yeah. weight division. Uh, so it it is in a in a world of competition in the MMA world where so many organizations make decisions that it's like why would you do that and like what are you thinking like update your website or whatever it is just reflect what yeah. it is. And, well, it, I tell you, it's the money. It's your cash cows. I mean, that's that's how they treat BYB does not treat their fighters like oh you're just a commodity. They actually treat you like they legitimately care about you. I mean, they really do and. Like I said, no, I'm not gonna call anybody out, but we I know how that goes because I've had too many conversations where it's like you don't give you don't care about the fighters, they don't care if you get hurt, they don't care what this happens or that happens. It's just rare when you get on the regional scene someone who is both interested enough and hardworking enough to like or or like crazy enough to take on like matchmaking or like running a regional promotion, but then also yeah. that person who has the right business acumen and, and like the, the work ethic to put in what you need to do, because like, you just got to be constantly looking for people to fill these events and constantly looking for better quality. Because if you're yeah. an MMA organization that's hanging around, you know, a steady level of talent that, you know, is at a lower level, it's kind of only a matter of time before you, it seems like they dissipate and something else comes up in their place that that's more innovative. Yeah, whole one hundred percent. And Mike Goldberg's awesome. One of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear that. It's cool. It's Shelby. It's got to be cool to hear Mike Goldberg say your name. This is something I just said <laughs> to Bob Hawkins, but that's got to be cool. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. I mean, they're just they're full with so many just talented individuals that have been in combat sports for years, and and it's every time I've been to a show, it's like oh my gosh, who is that? And then it's like, oh yeah, oh my goodness, I can't believe that's crazy. I didn't know that they, you know, that they were partnered with BYB. Okay, this is fun. Um, and they're so friendly. Everybody's just so nice. And there's, there's just, it's a lot of positivity and they have, they have adult conversations with you and don't make you feel like, you know, they're higher up than you and that they're running the show and, you know, that, you know, you're, you're below them. I mean, it's, there, there's just a lot of, of good energy and vibes and relationships when uh, it comes to BYB. Absolutely. And so this is something that I've gotten all kinds of interesting answers on is, you know, it was exclusively, you know, you started off with the, with the kickboxing and, uh, and then, you know, kept going in amateur MMA. But at a certain point back in uh, early 2023, it goes from, you know, amateur MMA to bare knuckle boxing. How did you end up getting into bare knuckle boxing and, and making the decision like, one, I'm going to throw myself into this. Like, I, I think I'm going to commit myself to bare knuckle boxing. And, you know, how did you go about preparing when there's such a quick turnaround from the end of your amateur MMA career to the start of your professional bare boxing career, bare, bare knuckle boxing career? Because it's got to be from I, I've heard from people like, yeah, like I just kind of made the decision like and and then gave myself a month to be ready. But what was the situation for you? I mean, honestly, I've been bare knuckle fighting since I was in high school. So I think that this has just been kind of part of who I am for a really long time. And when it came to making the transition from MMA to bare knuckle, I seen I seen the fights and I knew that that was what I was going to do. I mean, I I've said it before and, you know, and I stand with that. I knew I was going to do bare knuckle. It's just more my style. You know, I like the close counter, you know, the clinch work, the, in the pocket. I love the trigon because it's, you know, it's smaller. You have to fight, you know, people aren't running from you, you know, like I just, I get a rush from it. You know, I get a lot of satisfaction from it. There's just, um, there's just something about bare knuckle. I knew that I wanted to be a part of. And as far as preparation, I mean, 
you know, with Rob, he's kind of been preparing me without even knowing that he's been preparing me since we started training together back in 2020. So um, it's just all kind of fell together, you know, like his grittiness, his uh, Muay Thai background with the clinch and, you know, with his angles and his footwork. I mean, all of that has just kind of come together. And it's and it's really just been I just feel like it's just kind of been a song and a dance and it's just worked together nicely. And, And I mean, and here we are now fighting for a championship. And it's like, this is what we were meant to do. This is where we're supposed to be. And, uh, you know, it's, it is what it is. And there's so many interesting wrinkles to your style. Oh, I'm going to wait a second because we might have lost Shelby here buffering for a second. (laughs) If you don't mind, when she had her last flight, when she had her last, I'm sorry, fight for Island fights, really the only reason we took that fight is because we were working on getting her a bare knuckle. And it was like, because we knew it was taking some time, it was like, okay, we just got to stay busy. We have to stay active. So I threw the opp- opportunity at Shelby. And she's like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. I just got to fight. I just want to fight. I just want to go. So she's kind of wherever I lean towards, she's like, yeah, let's do it. As long as it's a fight and it keeps me busy, yeah, let's do it. And Yeah, so- it worked out well. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm glad. Uh, glad we got you back there. Because... Uh, what I was what I was saying um, when uh, so there's so many layers to your style like of fighting you know when you go back to amateur MMA you know the thing is you move like a boxer you know it, you you the the way you throw your punches the way that you avoid other people's punches and the way that you play defense that you move and strike like a boxer and yet. In, in the situations where you've needed to go for a takedown, you, you're very aggressive towards that. And it's not something that you're you're hesitant to pull the trigger on. And then when someone has you on your back, you're very aggressive in hunting for submissions. So it, it's, it's uh, you know, it's a very aggressive style, especially in MMA. Um, so, you know, what, what, how do you define your greatest strengths? And like, what, what do you think it is that, that manifested this, this, style that is just constantly looking to to score points and to, and to produce offense well i mean i would say footwork has always been a big one and you know just knowing when to be aggressive like that's something that coach rob has just always kind of said you know know when to be aggressive know when to be on defense just kind of pay attention and he tells me you know, don't look for it, just react. And so I feel like that's always been a key part of of our training as far as us being in the fight. It's not looking for it. It's just reacting, you know, like going with the flow, going with the flow of the fight, not trying to um, force anything, but yet when you need to be aggressive, then you need to be aggressive. You know, you've got to take, you got to take your openings when you have them. And that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at, even with the Agnesa fight. And like you, you see that kind of adjustment in your pro bare knuckle debut against Tamlin Cavan at BYB 18, because that was like a bull in the China shop approach. Like <laughs> <laughs> you started off very aggressively, <laughs> like like hunting for the clinch, grabbing her pushing her and, and kind of throwing her away. It was it was so clearly other the, the punches obviously were taking their toll, but just the way that she could not get a breath of fresh air, like at any second, you could tell very clearly took a toll on her. And folks, that was a fight that ended by verbal submission. Uh, I, I think before the start of round three or, or shortly, uh, shortly into the beginning of it. So like yeah. that, that fight is so interesting to what, because I would describe your your MMA style as aggressive, definitely. But that fight against Tamlin Cavan was like crazy. How like her her at the end of the day, her neck must have been the sorest thing at the uh, in the next. <laughs> that was the goal. Absolutely. Most most boxers Absolutely. don't like you hanging on the neck, and she did it perfect. Shelby, you buffered for a second, but what were you saying? Oh, I I just, I just said. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Shelby. I was just agreeing. Like, I was just agreeing. Like, absolutely. Yes. Her neck must have been very sore. <laughs> um, Some Somebody brought up, somebody had brought up, I won't say who, but talking about like hanging on the neck and saying that Shelby throws people to the ground Um, because you're not allowed to tie clinch. We had planned on that. And I had been telling Shelby and we had practiced it and Shelby had it in her head. Like, okay, 
they tie a clinch. If you get tie clinch, snap her up, snap her face to the floor. Don't even think about it. Just react. If she tie, if she clinches you, snap her to the floor. And everybody's like, oh, they're doing a snap. And they complained about Shelby tie clinching. And I'm like, but that girl tie clinched her first. That's why she got snapped to the floor. If she wouldn't have done that, she wouldn't have been face planted. That makes sense because that seemed like what the, uh, like, it seemed like every time that the ref would break it up, it seemed like there was a little bit more dialogue between everybody. So it, it, that he was sense. useless. <laughs> what the ref? <laughs> Yes, he was absolutely – he treated them like they were both his daughters and they were in a scrap in the backyard. He was about as unprofessional as you can get. And not just towards <laughs> Shelby and Tamlin, it was towards every fight. But he took – because they were the only girl fight, he was horrible. <laughs> well, you know, it happens. <laughs> It's crazy to think that that still happens. Because, like, the idea that you could be watching a Shelby Cannon fight and be like, uh, hold on, I need to like, I need to tone the this fight down a little bit. It's like I think everybody's fine here. Well, he he clearly he clearly did not know the rules. Not even close. It, it seemed like that. And Shelby. What's it like to be in a fight like that where you do have to like? I mean, maybe you don't, but like, what what is it if you? What is the the the, the thought process if you think that you might have to like work around a referee that you you're not really vibing with? I mean, honestly, I was just trying to do what I was told um, because, you know, I know that they have authority in that fight and whether they know the rules or whether they don't know the rules, they can still take points away. Um, you know, they can still they just have authority. So, I mean, I really was trying to listen and, and kind of take in what he was saying and process it. Um, but then there were just times where my instinct, you know, came in and it was like, ah, you know, I'm not doing that on purpose or like, oh, okay. Yeah, I get it. You know, and I think that right now with bare knuckle in general, we're all kind of learning in a sense. Um, so, you know, there's going to be, there's probably going to be some, you know, accidental things that happen and we're going to be like, oh yeah, okay. We can't do that. You know, with boxing, you know, there's certain things, um, you know, MMA and Muay Thai, like when you bring all these, these different combat sports together and we're all trying to be in bare knuckle, um, rules are different in all these sports. And so I think with bare knuckle being fresh, you know, we're just all trying to work out the kinks. And so I don't really hold that against the ref, um, or anybody else. I think it's more or less just trying to make sure you're playing your game smart. And so this is a, a question that I've gotten plenty of really interesting answers to as well is, you know, now after starting off and going through so many different amateur fights and organizations and MMA, and then being in pro bare knuckle boxing, it, bare knuckle has done a very good job of capitalizing on, you know, different streaming services that make things accessible to the, to the right demographics of people that are interested in it. They've done very good at attracting people from all worlds of combat sports to come and participate. And I think that they have a very good social media influence, you know, in a, in a, in an era of super fights, you know, the organizations like BYB and BKFC, like this was made for them to, to put on, you know, fights that are just interesting that people want to see. And so since the start of your pro bare knuckle career, have you noticed a, a, an expansion in your fan base or, or, or like that, that more opportunities are kind of available to you on the horizon? I mean, yeah, I would say that's, that's true. You know, people are real interested in bare knuckle. Like they don't, they have so many questions and, and I, I do, I get DMS and I get people on my, on my page and even like family and friends, like my already regular, like close people, um, that never really were into my MMA career are way more interested in the bare knuckle. And I don't know if it's because they're more worried about me. Or, you know, they're concerned, like, what are you doing? Are you absolutely out of your mind? Um, do I need to put a life insurance policy on you? Or, you know, if it, you know, I'm not really sure where their mindset is, but they're definitely asking questions. I feel like I'm doing a lot of educating on bare knuckle on, um, you know, on a regular basis. And, you know, MMA, I didn't feel like I talked about it a lot. And I, you know, and people are definitely asking questions about bare knuckle and I, I whether they uh, whether they're going to say it out loud or not I think people love the blood I think they love the grittiness they love they just love how fast it paced it is and with MMA you know sometimes fights are boring but bare knuckle you know it's just you're there and you're fighting and it's non-stop the whole time and it's hard for people to get past the 
I, I, for lack of a better term, like the brutality sometimes. Like it, MMA is such a new professional sport that like bare knuckle is a lot for the general public to get used to like super quickly uh, because they think it's more dangerous. And it's actually the opposite just because the thing that if a fighter ends up in serious, you know, health issues after a fight, it's almost always because of head trauma and not because of, you know, of cuts and bleeding. Um, and I, I, and I, I am not meaning to say that these two things are comparable at all, but I've also had Ryan Phillips from power slap on this podcast before. And it, it yes. It, it, so uh, thoughts about power slap aside, I was interested to talk to him just to see like what he was going to say about it. So when I asked him, like, you know, what would you say to somebody who said that like power slap is not a legitimate combat sport and like there's no reason to do it. And like, the, you know, he's a, he's a well-spoken dude. So like he rattled off a few things. And I was like, damn, that's a good point. So like there's, there's plenty. Uh, I, I think like bare knuckle is something that has like very quickly benefited from like an educational program from those organizations that are doing very well at promoting it. Is everybody frozen or is just nobody? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Everything I, just kind of sat there for a minute. I didn't know if... Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, no, I've, I've yet to watch Power Slap, but to stand there and let somebody hit me just baffles my mind. Well, that's that's not what I'm saying. That's what, that's what I was saying before. Oh, I know. You're talking about the medical aspect of it. Well, just that, but, like, you know... the there's so many things that not that long ago you never would have thought would exist at a major professional level. And now it's like yeah. there's, there's something specific everywhere in combat sports. And when it comes to bare knuckle, there's so many people that would be so close minded to it because they don't understand, you know, what combat sports really are, but it, it's those aspects that I think people are taking to. And it's why bare knuckle continues to grow at a fast pace. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, I, I agree with that. And I think that BYB has done a good job at getting education out there. And I was saying that I was reading something, I think that Dada 5000 put out there um, and it was online. And I think it was right when um, Greg Bloom ended up going and he was, he it was right when he became the attorney. Um, they were talking about it. And I was like, really? I didn't, when I was interested in bare knuckle, I did not realize that it was safer. I didn't realize that, you know, there wasn't as many brain trauma, you know, cases compared to traditional boxing. You know, I didn't even think about, oh, well, I'm just going to get cut and it's going to heal. Um, you know, I never really, honestly, and it, maybe it's ignorant, I didn't think about the dangers of bare knuckle when I was interested in bare knuckle. Um, but then as I have been into bare knuckle, yeah, you know, you are, we are learning that it isn't as dangerous as some of these other sports and especially MMA, like in my opinion, you know, I, I think I have way less chances of getting hurt going into a bare knuckle fight with a bare fist than going into an MMA fight with a elbow or a knee straight to my head um, over and over again, you know, and we could be on the ground or standing up and we could be getting um, elbows to the face. And I just feel like there's just way more, you know, torque in an elbow and a knee. But yeah, and I think that BYB has done a good job at um, talking about the awareness too. You know, gloves were just meant to protect the hands, not the head. Um, and so now, you know, 2-0 is a, a pro bare knuckle boxer, 2-0 under the BYB banner. Coming up on April 4th, you have a matchup for the Super Flyweight title against Agnesa Spitfire Kirikosian. Agnesa is a fighter that has a traditional boxing background. I think she held an intercontinental title uh, at one point in her in her pro boxing career. She is like her boxing is pretty to watch, you know, and she it, it's something that she started out in the traditional format and she fights her bare knuckle fights a lot of the time. Like like they're just boxing matches without gloves. And so it really is. It's, you know, on some scale, it's kind of like an unstoppable force versus a movable object fight that you got coming up on April 4th. What are your takes on the stylistic matchup that you got coming up against Ignessa? Uh, and and just your your thoughts on the matchup and, and what the title fight means to you overall. We might have lost Shelby for a second. Rob, any thoughts on the upcoming matchup against Ignessa? Uh, I 
if I had to guess, I'd say it's going to be bloody. It's 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 probably neither one of them. And that's one of the things like Michelle and I have talked about was uh, I'll give Agnesa credit. She she's like Shelby. There's no quit in her. There's no stopping. There's no. It's just okay. Move on to the next round. You do whatever. You give it all every round, and you you know chips fall where they may. And but neither one of them have a quit in them. And I I was kind of disappointed that it didn't get moved to the main event. But it's whatever. <laughs> but it's uh they're both good. They're both probably two of the toughest women I've ever seen in any combat sport. Um, they I I hope everybody tunes in and they realize what they're getting ready to watch because it's about to be a hell of a fight. All right, folks, Shelby is back with us. Uh, it looks like she's in a place with more reliable internet. Uh, <laughs> uh, you got a fight coming up on April 4th against Agnesa Spitfire Kirikosian. It's for the super flyweight title at BYB 25. Uh, and the thing about Agnesa, because I just talked to her earlier this week, BYB has me interviewing, uh, having on the podcast two different sets of opponents uh, for the whole week. I've never done that before, as I was just telling Rob. Uh, but She's like her boxing style is very pretty to watch. And she has a traditional boxing background. I think she held an intercontinental title at one point in her professional career, as I recall. And, you know, it, it's a it's sort of a unstoppable force against a movable object kind of matchup, you know, that you got coming up. So what on your what are your thoughts about Agnesa as an opponent? I know you say you, you've kind of been preparing for this fight for some time, but what are your thoughts on the stylistic matchup and what you got coming up at the beginning of April? I just think that she's very aggressive. Um, I, I think that she, I I mean, I like to watch her fights. I can't say I don't. Um, I've watched all of her fights. And I think that she is powerful. I think that she is aggressive. And, I mean, the only thing is, in my opinion, is she's not changed a whole lot from fight to fight. Um, so, I mean, unless she's doing something different between, you know, her last six, seven, eight fights, to now, um, I think I really know what to expect getting in there with her. And that's what we're training for. Um, but, you know, everybody does, you know, they get better and they, um, I don't know. I just, I feel like she might be pretty to watch, but I'm the one that's getting better. I feel like in my camps, I'm consistently training new things and I'm progressing my training and my, my skills. And, for her, I think it's going to be the same old, same old. And so now, like with this fight coming up, do you have any plans to return to MMA anytime soon? No, I'm not really interested in MMA right now. I wouldn't mind doing traditional boxing, um, but I would not, I probably would not take an MMA fight this year. Um, not really looking into MMA, but I am looking into traditional boxing just to stay active in between fights um you know just to get some more experience as far as the boxing is concerned um but but i i, I like the hands i like the boxing i like the footwork you know the angles of boxing so so yeah outside of bare knuckle just traditional boxing is really the only thing i think i'd be interested in this year folks this has been a conversation with shelby Boom, boom, cannon fighting out of fighting out of Anderson, Indiana. She's got a title fight against Agnesa Spitfire Kirikosian at BYB 25 coming up on April 4th. Check it out. I, I'm talking to everybody from BYB 25 this week, and it seems like it's going to be a fantastic event. This has been a great conversation. I was so glad to have you and Rob on, especially on those moments when they were buffering. I've never had the benefit of having someone there who is uh, who we could pick up the conversation with when there was uh, when there was internet issues going. So thank you very much to Rob for that. But Shelby, th this has been uh, this has been fantastic and enlightening. If there's anything else that you want to say, anybody you want to shout out, social media handles, the floor is yours. I mean, I just am grateful for all of my support from family and friends. And we're going to put on a show, uh, BYB 25 down in the Bay. So just tune in on um, Sling. You can watch it. You can search BYB 25. I think you can get on Roku and you can watch it. Um, I think BN Sports Extra is where you can get on and you can type in BYB. It'll pop up. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'm just preparing for a war. So, Folks. 
we got another UFC uh, pick em episode coming up for UFC Atlantic City this weekend. Uh, that might have already happened by the time that this comes out. But it, <laughs> it's always a big week in mixed martial arts nowadays. Folks, thank you so much for listening. Enjoy the coming weeks of combat sports. Look forward to BYB 25. Peace.